Hi, I am Dave Mola. I'm a product manager at Google, and I am going to be talking about how to create irresistible products in four steps. Gonna, uh, to start this talk, I'm going to give you some background on me. Uh, I'm going to talk through why you should consider listening to me. Um, we'll talk through what I believe is the primary job of a product manager. Um, we'll go through the four steps uh, to create an ir irresistible product. Uh, we'll then apply that to an example product. Um, and then I'll close this talk with some resources of how you can uh, excel in these four steps. Just keep in mind, this is a broad topic. Uh, so we're going to be taking a 10,000 foot view of product management. Um, and my hope is to give you a framework um, and some specific tools uh, so that you can be able to create great products on your own. Uh, okay, so some background on me. Uh, I have been lucky to have the privilege to work as a PM for the last 17 years um, at a whole broad range of companies, hardware, software, across the board. Um, if I kind of reflect on my uh, time as a PM, I can kind of break it up into four distinct phases. My early days, big company days, startups, um, and my return back to big tech. Um, specifically, uh, I got a uh, undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering from Cornell University, um, then worked at Boeing, Pratt & Whitney, Ford on planes, jet engines, cars, kind of my dream job out of college uh, in, as an engineer. Um, went back to business school uh, at Dartmouth and got my MBA. Um, and then that's when I really started my career as a product manager um, back in 2004 uh, as a product manager at Amazon. Uh, later went to work at T-Mobile for five years in a variety of roles um, and came back to Amazon uh, as uh, heading up their Amazon App Store and leading a team of 10 product managers there. Um, I then got the itch to join startups and try out that world uh, and was fortunate to be able to work on five different startups, uh, mostly Silicon Valley startups, uh, um, ranging from Flywheel and Digio, which are mobile apps, and even Lookout, which is a security mobile app, to working on my own startup, which is Izora, which was a drone um, and then Keep, which is a CRM tool for small businesses. Um, while I was at startups, I was aiming to kind of hit a home run. Uh, I'd say most of these were more of first base hits or second base hits. Um, and so after kind of this stint of five years at startups, I kind of itched to return back to big tech. Um, and since then, I've been at Logitech on their smart home team. Um, and then most recently, for the last two and a half years, I've been at Google working on in their ads team. Cool. Uh, okay. So... Given that, why should I listen to you, right? Um, shows I've worked at a broad range of companies. One could say I like to jump around to companies and try a lot of different things. Uh, how it makes that me qualified? Um, I want to give you kind of three potential reasons. Um, the first is when I joined Amazon back in 2004, um, we were just experimenting with third-party selling business. Um, I was the first product manager on that, that business. Um, that, when I left, was generating half of Amazon's profits, um, and now it's an $81 billion business that was built on a lot of the core platform that I put in place. Um, additionally, when I was at T-Mobile, um, this was back in 2007, they were largely a call-first company, um, and they were wanting to make the move into data, mobile data, uh, but they were having challenges because it would take nine months to create a new data plan. Um, and I led a large 60-person cross-functional team to revamp their entire data plan pricing platform so that they could launch data plans in a matter of days uh, where it typically would take nine, nine, 10 months to create a new data plan. That led the way to them starting to innovate in this space um, and data being a pretty large contributor to their service revenue. Um, and finally, at Google, I've been now working on local service ads, specifically if you search for a plumber, electrician, personal injury lawyer, we are the unit that shows at the very top of search results. Um, when I joined, we were once again kind of an experiment, small, you know, 50 mil, sub, sub $100 million business. Uh, in the last two years, uh, two and a half years, been able to grow that to a $500 million business, and we're on a trajectory to be $3 billion in the next three to five years. 
So, uh, hopefully that's convinced you. Wait, wait, but actually, I don't think that makes me qualified. In fact, I don't even believe these three things I showed you make me even remotely qualified to give this talk. Hmm. So then what does? Uh, right? Uh, and I actually believe it's because I'm a failure. And what do I mean by that? It means I have worked on so many products over the last 17 years that just did not work. They did not succeed. They not, did not deliver on what our objectives were. Um, they were failures. Um, everything from planes to engines to cars to software to mobile apps to wireless service to smart devices to sporting goods, you name it, I've crashed and burned it. Um, and so probably wondering why would I share this with you? you. Um, and I firmly believe that failure is so important. Um, and, you know, we focus a lot on success, but it's really these failures that are where we learn um, and we know what to do to not fail the next time. And that leads to that great success and leads you to be delivering high impact and products that your customers just can't live without. Um, and so I think I've been fortunate enough to take those failures that I've gone through really reflect and take time to think about what worked, what didn't work. Um, and I firmly believe that the four steps that I'm going to show you are a distillation of truly what works um, and the three kind of levers and steps to really create products that are awesome, that really your customers can't live without. They are irresistible. Um, so with that, I want to give you a little bit of motivation of why these steps are important. I do, I've seen this time and time again, where a great product manager in a company can generate at least a hundred times the value they are paid. Uh, what that means is they may have a salary, they may have a resource team that are applied to this product. And if they are successful due to the work of that product manager, uh, along with his direction, his or her direction of the team, uh, that product can deliver a hundred times, sometimes even thousand times the resources uh, that were invested on that product. Um, I've seen that time and again, firmly believe that um, and firmly believe in the value that a product manager, if they are skilled, that they can deliver to a company. Um, and I do fully believe and have seen this in my career as well as with my colleagues that if you can master these skills, you name it in terms of tech companies, even consumer goods companies, any type of product company, this, these skills make you incredibly valuable uh, and in high demand by these companies. Okay, uh, with that, let's dive in. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about what is an irresistible product, right? What do we mean by that term? Um, so I, I'd, I'd argue it's three things. One is you can build it. If you can't build it, it it's never going to even be a product, right? So that's kind of a first prerequisite. Um, second one is customers want it. Right, so that makes it irresistible. Um, and the third is you make money off of it, and this is important because you know you can create a great product and give it away for free, but if you eventually can't make money on it long term, eventually that product's you're just not going to be able to continue to invest and make it better over time. So you want it to be sustainable and lasting. Um, and if you look at kind of some of the lingo that's used to describe these uh, aspects, um, typically people refer to the ability to build it as feasible, right? It's feasible, it can be built. Um, it's desirable as in customers want it. Uh, and it's viable as in it's a viable business. You, make, you can make money off of it and you can continue to uh, continue to sell that product and iterate and make it better, right? Okay, so that seems all simple enough, not, certainly not rocket science. If that's the case and it's so easy, why do so many products fail? Um, well, what we can do is we can just invert what makes an irresistible product, what makes an irresistible product, a non-irresistible product <laughs> um, is you can't build it, your customers don't want it, and you can't make money off of it. Um, and the lingo for this is typically there's execution risk execution that you actually can't build what you are intending to build, right? Uh, market risk, you know, you launch it and the market doesn't want it, right? Customers don't want it. That's typically the term that's used. Uh, and then finally, financial risk, right? You can't make money off of it. You and in, you invest a bunch of resources on it, money to launch it and then market it. And then it, that money that you make in revenue and profit doesn't 
make up for the resources and the marketing that was spent and sales team that was spent on it. Right. So that's financial risk. Um, I would argue as a PM, your primary job is to eliminate these risks. And if you can eliminate these risks, then you can get to a great product and an irresistible product. Um, so there are a lot of things as a PM you could be spending your time on. There's so many distractors, particularly at a large company. Um, and I argue that focusing on these three areas and doing them well uh, is is a core, is probably the most important part of your job and uh, kind of the impact you'll make in your role. Um, that said, it's kind of just hard to say, oh, you know, solve execution risk, solve market risk, solve financial risk. Uh, how exactly do you do that? Um, and that's where these four steps come in. Um, if you look at the four steps, um, they are vision, design, execution, and learn. And don't worry, we'll go into these, all of four of these in quite a bit more detail. Um, but from a high level, this is the four steps. And then I would say maybe a 4A step is you take those learnings and you iterate. And you continue that process of going through these four steps. Uh, and as you continue to do that, you eventually come out with a product that your customers absolutely can't live without and what I call it an irresistible product. Right? Um, so how do these four steps actually prevent that failure that we talked about? Um, and I won't go through it in detail, but I do believe that every one of these steps specifically is targeting one of these risks and trying to de-risk it. So as an example, if we look at execute market risk, um, when you execute, and if you execute well, you can execute and ensure that your product is high quality, it's bug free, it works as intended. It's, and so that increases the chance that your customers are going to love it and want to continue to use it. Similarly, in the design uh, execution phase, um, if you are have very clear clarity on what to build, that reduces the execution risk because there's a uh, there's reduced risk of delays or going over budget or things not being built as intended. Um, so we won't go through all 12 of these uh, these boxes, uh, but these just kind of the high level is each one of these steps are specifically targeted to, to reduce those risks that we have. Right? So really just focus on executing on these steps well. Um, so with that, let's actually go through each one of these steps in more detail. We've seen how they kind of high level work together. How do you actually put them into practice? Um, let's start with the vision. So the objective of the vision is to paint a clear picture of the problem. What problem are you solving? What is your solution? Who's the customer who's, who has that problem and would, would use your solution? And what value are you delivering? And how is that better than all the other alternatives that are out there on the market, right? Um, typically, depending upon the size of the company, the resources you have, but typically it's led by a product manager. Um, you oftentimes have a researcher. If it's a startup, you may be the researcher. Um, that be market research, user research, kind of different ways to understand the industry and the opportunity. Um, and then you oftentimes have executive sponsors and investors. Those are people in kind of higher level positions who are going to invest resources to make your vision a reality. And once they've invested, they are a sponsor and will help you unblock you so that you can actually realize your vision. Um, um, so what is that vision process? Um, there are three sub steps of the vision step. Um, the first is uh, identifying customer jobs. Um, and so you're probably wondering, what is a job? So there's a framework um, called Jobs to be Done, which some of you may or may not have heard of. Um, I fundamentally, I would say that's probably been the most impactful, impactful framework on my career uh, in terms of how I actually like approach product management and product development and product definition. Um, so as part of that, we'll, you identify customer jobs and I'll go into detail of how we do that. Um, we use that to then create and really paint that vision. So it's crystal clear in your mind, right? Um, what that vision is and the problem and solution that you have. Uh, and then finally, you take that vision, you share that with others. So they're crystal clear as well. Right. So with customer jobs, let's start with that step. Um, the theory behind jobs to be done framework is your customer is hiring your product and they're hiring that product to get a job done. So as an example, they may be hiring product school to because 
I I want to be part of product school because I want to get a job as a PM, right? And there's other potential schools that are in avenues that I can uh, hire to get a job as a PM. But and I, and when I so research them and select one, I'm looking for one that labels me to get a job done fast. It's fun. It's easy. It's effective, uh, et cetera. Right. Uh, and so what you want to do is then design your product that performs that job better than all those, those other alternatives. So you're actually kind of flipping it on, on the, on the head and saying, what do people want? Right. Let's build that perfect product. Um, and so with that, you identify the jobs, you identify that selection criteria, you really get a deep understanding of like what consumers, customers are hiring your product for. Right. And how are they how are they how are they going through that hiring process? You then paint that vision, right? So you take that customer jobs and you say, okay, given that, obviously there isn't a solution that accomplishes that job done, and there's a problem with that, right? There's something, a need that's not being met. So very crystal clear on what that problem you're solving is, how you're solving that your solution, why it's better than those existing alternatives, particularly in getting those jobs done addressing those selection criteria, um, how your customers would use it and how you'd make your mon make money off of it. And that kind of goes into problem, solution, customer, what the actual opportunity, market opportunity is, convert those into financials and assumptions and a financial model. And then you say, here's the team that I have that I'm going to execute or that I need or that I already have that we're going to execute on, make this vision a reality. Um, finally, you go and you share that vision and you make it broadly across all of your team members. If they have any concerns, you meet with them one on one, you address their concerns so they're fully bought in. They understand why this is important and they're really excited and rally behind this vision that you've created, right? And you want to be getting the entire team, whether it be exec an executive sponsor, managers of all the different cross function areas, as well as all your team members to really have the same vision in their mind picture of what you're trying to accomplish. Um, I can't tell you how important that shared vision is. And I too totally believe and have seen so many examples of where a cross-functional team with a shared vision can take the impossible and make it possible. Totally believe that. Um, with design, okay, so now you've created this, painted this picture, you've shared this vision. Now you want to turn your vision in the design step, turn that vision into clear instructions to engineering on exactly what to build, right? Um, and so that, once again, you're leading, typically leading that, uh, but you're working very closely with a UX researcher and a UX designer. Um, and then at this point, engineers are also coming in uh, to give feedback and kind of understand and uh, weigh in on those designs and how feasible those designs are. In that design process, um, you typically have three sub steps. One is deciding. So you painted this kind of broad vision. You now actually have to narrow it down to exactly what exactly does that solution look like. Um, you then prototype that, test that with users. Once you iterate on that a couple of times, get that to where it's customers are really wanting that product and that that solution that you've defined. Um, then you go and you put that into specs and detail for your engineers to be able to execute on. Um, so. As I mentioned, in that design, the side phase, you're you're now taking this vision and you're really putting it the details and the meat to it. Um, one tool that I find very effective is something called product questions. Um, in that, you list out all of the decisions that you need to make on your product, all of the potential permutations and solutions, um, and then you think through it on your own first, come up with a recommendation, and then meet with your cross-functional team, and you have. Uh, lively debate uh, and ensure that each of the recommended decisions that you make on those product questions are well thought out um, and kind of best to meet the needs of all of your stakeholders as well as your customer. Um, you then take that, uh, take those product questions, take that vision, take the jobs and selection criteria you have, uh, pull inspiration from other solutions in your industry as well as outside of your industry, um, and work with your UX designers to create mocks uh, and prototypes that you then go and run user studies uh, and actually test your solution with customers to see whether they value it. Uh, and you continue to do that and 
keep that framework of jobs that they're trying to accomplish a job, really understand their selection criteria, really understand whether your solution that you have is better meeting that selection criteria, and you iterate and iterate until you get to this product uh, that they want and solution that your customers just can't live without, right? They're salivating, they're like, I want that, right? That's, just, that's where you wanna to get to. Um, once you have that, then your goal is to take that and just define that solution in so much detail that engineering can build it without ambiguity. And so you wanna have very detailed mocks, user flows that talk step through what happens when a user clicks a button, what are all the edge cases, error conditions, kind of all diagrammed out, um, and then convert that into user stories that describe uh, exactly how your work, your product works in all scenarios, in all edge cases, in all hero cases as well. Um, so that design step has two distinct phases. There is the iterating on your solution that we talked about prototyping, iterating on your solution and keeping doing that until your customers are like, I want that, I have to have that, right? Once you've achieved that, then specifying your solution so it's crystal clear to engineering on what to build. Um, okay, so now you have detailed specs, you have mocks, engineering's clear on what to build, now you execute and how, and the goal of that execution step is really building your solution efficiently and as at high a quality bar as possible. Um, and at this point, you're more now working with the engineers and the QA team, right? Um, that execution process, there are three sub-steps. Um, one is the actual development work. Second is test. The third is resolving issues. So let's dive into those. Uh, in the development step, you are empowering your engineering team, team to build that solution as efficiently as possible. Um, and so some typical tools that are used, this is more in an agile type environment or scrum based company. Um, you use tools like a backlog, which contains all of your stories in priority order. You then plan those into sprints, which may be one to two week blocks where your engineering team will take a, a set amount of stories and execute on those. And then they'll do those as part of sprints, right? Um, and you'll burn down the backlog as you develop your solution, right? Um, the second step is testing. So as those sprints are completed, uh, you ideally want to do continuous releases. So a body of stories have been completed. You release that as an app or a web website. Um, and then you're able to verify each one of the stories that was delivered and make sure it's actually like been delivered and developed correctly. Uh, and then finally, when it all comes together and the product's ready to release, there's kind of thorough end-to-end -end testing to make sure that the product that you've created works beautifully across uh, kind of end-to-end -end scenarios. Um, finally, the last stage is resolve. And this is, I'd say, incredibly important. So as your engineers are developing the product, they, they may uncover edge cases or conditions or parts of the product that you haven't thought of or haven't specified. Um, and so they'll have questions, they'll have issues, they'll raise those, and so you want to have a very open channel of communication with your engineering team. So whenever they are blocked or have questions, they can raise those to you. You can identify those issues, you can look at what those options are, and you can make decisions quickly, the right decisions, and unblock them so they can continue on development. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned, you're the ex exec execution stage, your goal is to ensure those your engineers can build your solution as efficiently and at a high quality bar as possible. Okay, final stage, we have learn. Um, up until now, particularly in your vision and design steps, uh, what you've created are hypotheses. These are your beliefs on what the problems and solutions are. You are testing them with a small set of users in your user tests and with your prototypes and mockups, uh, but it's still a hypothesis. Uh, in the learn phase, you now launched, and now you actually have data and you have customer feedback from a large set of customers and from your sales team and marketing team, and you can determine whether your solution is delivered on its intended objectives. Uh, and then most importantly, you course correct, right? Um, and so typically you'll have a data analyst you'll work with it, or you, if it's a small company, you'll be doing the data ana analysis work, uh, and then you'll have a researcher as well who's gathering data from the market and from your users. Um, and 
typically you will, there's kind of three sub steps. One is actually measuring and getting as much inputs uh, to you as possible. Uh, second is actually making sense of those and analyzing those. So you have a really deep understanding of what's going on. And the third is to update. So to take your vision and your designs and your hypotheses and update them. So they incorporate all of the learnings you have from the measure and analyze phase. So in the measure, you're measuring all of the assumptions in your vision. Um, you can have metrics, dashboards, reports, get surveys from customers, feedback from sales. Those are all basically channels to measure those assumptions that you had um, and really understand how your product's performing in the market. Um, you then go and analyze, so specifically understand. So you have general ideas of what it's what's performing and you may wanna do deep dives into deep dive analyses, track exactly how funnels are going through your product, uh, how customers are repeat using your product. Uh, you'll pull uh, database queries, you'll visualize those data, so you'll kind of run spreadsheet analysis to have a really deep understanding of how your product's being used, its strengths, and where it's kind of falling flat and where it should be improved. Um, and then finally, you take those learnings from the measure and analyze, and you incorporate that into your roadmap. You find out what problems you thought you were going to solve, but you haven't solved that still need to be solved, or subsequent problems that need to get solved. Um, and you use those uh, to plan and launch subsequent releases of your product. So you take this, you update your vision, update your designs, update your roadmap, uh, and you continue to release products that get better and better and solve more and more of your customer problems. Right. Um, so as I mentioned, the learn step is really where you determine whether you're, the original hypothesis that you had is correct, uh, and then you adjust based on all your learnings. Right. Um, so here are the four steps, the vision, design, execute, and learn. And the final piece is, I just want to iter uh, kind of reiterate that there, uh, how important iteration is. Um, so specifically, you take that learning and you take it back to your vision, you update your hypothesis of what your problem and solution are, you incorporate that into your next versions of your designs, you execute, you learn, you continue to do that. And the more iterations you can do, the faster you can do them, the sooner you can narrow down to a product that your customers absolutely love and that deliver on your business goals and can be a viable product for the long term. Great. Awesome. So we have all the theory out there. Let's actually apply this to a product and see how this would actually go look in practice. Um, I went on to TechCrunch and pulled the first product I saw, which was Zendesk Insights. Um, and so we'll use that as, uh, as, a, as an example for how we could apply these steps. Uh, so let's say you're the product manager for Zendesk Insights. Um, what is Zendesk, in Zendesk first of all? Um, it's an online tool for tracking and resolving customer issues. So typically a customer issue comes in via email or a phone call. It's tracked via a ticket and that's in Zendesk. Um, and so as a product manager, you, you have this tracking system. Now you wanna be able to take data from these tickets and give deeper insights into these companies so they under, better understand their customer reaction, uh, interactions, right? Okay, so let's apply the four steps uh, to this product. All right. So first of all, we wanna set the vision for Zendesk Insights. Let's say you're, you're creating that, you kind of think Initially, some, somebody kind of mentions this idea and you're like, wow, I should actually like solve this and create a product around it. Um, so the first step is really identifying those customer jobs, right? So an, a, an example would be if you have a company that's using Zendesk, they want to understand how customers interact with us um, and they want to know specifically what do they need to change in their, their customer support processes, right? Uh, similarly, they have selection criteria of, of how if they had different ways from not even using Zendesk Insights to you know, manually pulling queries based off the data to using Zendesk Insights, they'll have selection criteria they'll use to decide whether they actually want to use Zend the product that you have, right, that you're coming out with. Um, you'll go, you'll research those existing solutions, you'll research these pain points, those will inform your customer jobs, and then you'll convert that into this vision deck of here are the jobs that are being performed, here's the problem, the solution, the customer, uh, et cetera. Right. 
Um, you then take that vision, um, maybe get some inspiration from other reporting dashboards, um, and then you work with your UX designer to create mocks, prototypes of that experience that really deliver on those jobs and selection criteria. And then you create prototypes of your Zendesk insights, um, test those with users, continue to take their feedback, iterate to where they're like, yes, that's it, I want it. Uh, and then finally, you take those that prototype and you convert those into detailed mocks and stories that describe in detail to your engineering team how that should work. Um, final, uh, next step is you turn that into a backlog of stories, um, even potentially create releases of that. You may need not need to launch everything all at once. Um, and you create those weekly sprints to tackle those stories in chunks, continually release builds as features are developed, test to make sure all of those stories that you've defined have been met. Um, and then if there are any questions that your engineering team has, you identify and resolve those. And finally, when you launch, you go back to, in your vision deck, all of those metrics that you had defined uh, that were important to your business model and your financials uh, and your product success. You track those. Those could be related to adoption, revenue, usage. You perform analyses to really understand exactly what's going on, supplement that with surveys from customers to get their feedback, and then you use that to plan subsequent versions of the product based off the feedback and really inform your roadmap and what next releases you need to launch. Right. Awesome. So um, I want to shift gears now to how these steps are actually practiced in companies. Um, and I'm just going to give you my experiences uh, having worked at Amazon, uh, having currently working at Google, um, as well as I picked one of the startups I worked at, Flywheel, uh, which is a, offers a, offered a mobile app for hailing taxis, kind of similar to Uber, but using taxis. Um, and just want to walk through how, in my experience, these companies actually practice these steps. Keep in mind some of the Amazon stuff. I, last, I left Amazon uh, about eight years ago, so maybe a little bit dated, but this is kind of what I experienced. Um, so they all have their own ways of doing things and they're kind of core to the culture and how they actually develop and create products. Um, I want to focus on kind of things that each one of these companies does especially well. Um, and you'll actually even see that in their products and in, in their culture. Um, so first, starting with Amazon. Amazon has a very unique way of doing a vision, um, something called a working backwards doc or also called a press release FAQ. PRFAQ is their short lingo. Um, with that vision doc, what they do is they actually say, if this product launched, you know, two, three years, four years from now, and it was the product that everybody had to have, what would that press release look like? And what would be an FAQ that describes that product, right? So they're starting where, with what they want to achieve, that vision they want to achieve, and they're working backwards. Uh, they're, 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 everything's worked backwards from there. Um, so that's a really unique way to get and paint that picture of that vision and continue to iterate on it and get to something that customers like want and kind of de describe that to the rest of your team. Uh, in the design phase, I think one thing Google does is extraordinarily well in the design phase is there's two aspects, I'd say, of design. There's UX design, which is your mocks and your prototypes, how that experience looks. There's also the technical design, which is how responsive it's low latency, it's fast, it scales. Uh, Google really excels at that, that step uh, of taking your UX designs and converting those into architecture and scalable engineering systems um, that can grow as you grow to billions of users, which is kind of a problem Google uniquely has. <laughs> um, now we go to execute phase. Amazon in their DNA is an incre incredible at execution. And uh, I've seen this as a working within Amazon, as well as uh, at companies who've partnered and, and been done deals with Amazon where they can deliver things at a very rapid pace. A good part of that is they have a strong culture of having a TPGM or technical program manager who typically partners with a product manager and will be responsible for delivery of that product. Um, and they are incredibly skilled at getting team members and engineering teams, cross-functional engineering teams to execute efficiently on your designs uh, and your definition that you've put together as a product manager. Um, additionally, if you look at startups, 
while big companies may sometimes still be in the waterfall mode where they have product requirement stocks and then they create a grant GAN chart and it's over you know course of multiple months they come up with big releases most startups have switched over to the agile scrum mode uh, where they have user stories sprints backlogs and in my personal experience things that could take six seven months to do in a large company could be done in a matter of days or weeks at a startup um, and a lot of that is because of these agile processes. Um, and then finally, um, typically the big companies will build their own kind of in-house tools from dashboards to loggings to metric tools. Uh, what's nice when you work at the startups is you can access the latest and greatest vendors and technology that's out there and you can use really cool dashboards. I really love Mixpanel, Amplitude. Um, some examples of those for logging metrics and event tracking. Um, you can, can use those for dashboards, loggings, and metrics tools to get really deep insights of what's what's happening with your product. Okay, um, what I just shared with you is the tip of the iceberg um, in these four steps. I just wanted to give you kind of this framework for you to apply when you create your own products. Um, but within each one of those steps, um, there's so much to learn. And I would say, I've been doing product management for 17 years now. I'm still learning, right, uh, and perfecting those tools. So I hope I've kind of motivated you that this is a framework that you can use and then kind of start your journey to, to become, to master each one of those steps. Um, I want to also kind of leave with you a couple of resources. So these were some books that were influential in my career um, in helping me shape how I do product management. Um, so I want to share with you. Uh, and you'll see across the board, these talk about all the steps and kind of those are kind of been baked into the, each of these books. Um, so starting with the jobs to be done, I kind of mentioned that to you earlier. Um, that to me, that approach of really Thinking of your product as something that consumers hire has been a game changer for me and how I think of products and how I can assess whether a product is going to be work or not and meet the needs of consumers. Um, and there's a great book by Anthony Ulwick who created the Jobs to be Done framework um, where he talks about how you actually apply that. Uh, and you can apply that to the vision, the design, the learn stage. Uh, Blue Ocean Strategy is a great book to come up with the vision and making sure that your vision is unique and different from all the other solutions on the market. He calls where it's similar as everything else, it's called the red ocean and you're going to be kind of fighting with other, other products to where you have a blue ocean where you come up with really some unique solution um, that's different from the rest and you can kind of create your own market around that. Uh, Nail It and Scale It's amazing for iteration. So it focuses on that vision design iteration phase where you first nail your product, you nail the problem, you nail the solution, you nail how your marketing is going, you nail your business model, uh, you get all of those working and then you scale it, right? So you do that vision, design, learn, execute uh, cycle in small market and then once that works and you can focus on scaling it. Um, Additionally, Inspired is great for, I, I particularly took uh, a lot of insights in the design phase, uh, particularly it focuses on the pro creating prototypes and testing those with users and getting using prototypes to really understand what your consumers want. Uh, and then finally, kind of books on Scrum uh, really help you understand the kind of that execute model using Scrum or Agile to quickly be able to execute and be able to do that iteration cycle fast. One final thing I would say, uh, in addition to these books where I have learned, I'd say the most from uh, beyond my own personal experiences has been looking at other PMs. And I know these folks probably don't consider themselves PMs. They are probably more consider themselves entrepreneurs, founders, CEOs. You have Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, and James Dyson, who is the founder of the Dyson Vacuum Cleaner, who I greatly admire. Um, I spend a lot of time just, and I encourage you to spend time listening to interviews on YouTube and any other kind of video resources, and they will actually talk through how they approach business problems, uh, how they create products, kind of their mental models and what, what they value. Uh, and 
when you listen to them, you see a lot of the same themes around creating a compelling vision, failing and learning. James Dyson and Elon Musk are, have lots to talk about failure. Um, iterating um, design with Steve Jobs, I mean, probably the best uh, in terms of PMs I know on design. Um, and so they'll really bring alive these steps and show how you can how they've been applied in practice and been able to create not only great products, but great companies as well that have lasted and created a lot of value you for lots of stakeholders. Um, awesome. So with that, I want to thank you so much for listening to this. Um, and I really hope that you can take some of this and this can be used as a framework for you to create great products in the future that deliver lots of value, both to your customers as well as to the company that you work at. Awesome. Thank you. Bye-bye.